Hello everyone. Welcome to another Bach Cantata introduction. My name is uh, Mark Bangert and I will be offering some thoughts and observations about Cantata 180, uh, Schmicke dich o meine Seele. Some cantatas uh, charm most anyone upon first hearing. Uh, this is one of them, I believe, and uh, as such it joins the ranks of uh, Sister Cantatas uh, number four, for instance, Grieslag and Todesbanden, um, or number 140, Wachet auf, Ruft uns die Stimme. Uh, there are a couple of reasons, I think, why that's the case. Uh, first of all, this cantata is based on a well-known and well-loved hymn. Uh, and secondly, uh, the mood uh, the various movements of this cantata, uh, the mood is quite clear and uh, sort of immediately accessible. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out uh, what the composer is trying to do. The uh, lexical details of this cantata, that is, uh, for what Sunday it was written and what uh, the first performance date was, uh, are located in your program. So. Uh, we don't need to repeat that here. Uh, rather, I'd like to uh, do four things for you today. One is to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what kind of cantata this is and the hymn on which it's based. And then secondly, I'd like to talk some about uh, its theology. And then thirdly, I'd like to talk about what I call the Subway Shop Orchestra, uh, for which it's scored. And then finally, to offer some uh, some hints about what to be listening for uh, in the cantata itself. So we say that this is a chorale cantata, and what that means is that uh, the second year that Bach was in Leipzig, uh, although there's no precise record of this, he apparently uh, decided that he was going to do a series, a year-long series, of cantatas based on chorales. Mostly he accomplished that goal, uh, but this is one of the cantatas which he composed during that yearly cycle. Um, the cycle took place between uh, fall, late summer and fall of 1724 uh, to late spring 1725. The uh, cantata, uh, chorale cantatas, uh, come in various shapes and sizes. Um, this one is rather typical. Uh, an unknown poet uh, takes a nine stanza hymn and turns it into a seven movement cantata. And he does that in three different ways. First of all, um, he does it with the first movement and the last movement by taking the stanzas and melody as they exist in the hymn. So first Movement is stanza one of the hymn, the last movement is stanza nine of the hymn. Uh, secondly, he sometimes takes two stanzas of the hymn and sort of mashes them together to make one movement of the cantata. And then the other uh, third way that he uh, accomplishes his task, or she for that matter, uh, is that uh, the uh, uh, poet uh, paraphrases the hymn stanza and comes up with some new poetry. Bach uses the tune of the hymn three times during the cantata. In the first stanza, or first movement, he uses the stand, first stanza of the hymn together with its tune. And as, as I just said before, the last uh, setting of the chorale, the last uh, movement of the chorale is the last stanza of the hymn. In movement three of the cantata, he introduces the hymn stanza uh, with its tune uh, somewhat into the movement itself, and he ornaments the tune some. It's not exactly straight the way you would hear it in the hymn book or hear a congregation sing it, uh, but he ornaments it a little bit. Uh, the rest of the music from the cantata is new. The uh, author of the original hymn is Johann Frank, uh, who was born in the same year that the Thirty Years' War began. So a good part of his 
uh, life coincided with the Thirty Years' War. Uh, he was a lawyer uh, and a politician. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if our politicians today were poets of his caliber? Uh, but he was also mayor of a small little village uh, in Brandenburg, and the name of the village was Gaben. He was quite prolific with his poetry. He published two volumes uh, in which uh, you can find about 110 sacred poems, uh, so-called sacred poems, uh, some of which uh, pass off as hymns. Um, in our uh, hymn collections these days, he's known only for two hymns, but both are rather famous. Uh, this one, Schmecke dich, O liebe Seele, uh, which is often translated, Soul adorn thyself with gladness. And the other one that he's quite famous for is uh, Jesu meine Freude, uh, Jesus Price's treasure. For this particular hymn, he gave it a subtitle, and he said, Preparation for Holy Communion. Um, you can understand then that uh, with that subtitle, the hymn came to be associated with the Sunday on which the gospel is read uh, from uh, Matthew, I think it is. And the gospel has to do with, um, with the story of the uh, great wedding feast to which many are invited, some don't come, and so on. Uh, you'll probably recall that story. So the hymn sort of fits well into uh, the notion of, of wedding feast because we often think of uh, the Holy Eucharist as being a foretaste, we say, of the great feast to come. Uh, and the best feast of all is always a wedding feast. The work is in seven movements. Um, the usual book ends, which we talked about before. And then uh, th three recitatives, uh, all of which are quite not normal, and we'll talk about those later, and uh, two lovely arias. It's scored for uh, mixed choirs, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, soprano, tenor, bass, soloists, and as I said before, a kind of subway shop orchestra. Now, if it's true that Bach's cantata served as a kind of a musical homily on Sundays and feast days, uh, we might want to ask the question, what is this homily really about? I suppose if you had to reduce it to one sentence um, uh, explanation, it would come out something like this. This is a musical, dramatic, spiritual journey propelled by a then popular imagery for a believer's relationship with Christ. Now you might want to get into that thicket a little bit and open it up. Um, the imagery um, emerges from the notion of a wedding celebration. Uh, the time when we celebrate two people who are deeply in love and uh, the whole celebration itself is a ritualization of their coming together, pledge of their love for one another, and for the um, uh, physical union which will follow. And all of that kind of imagery is present in the um, uh, type of poetry that we sometimes call bride, bridegroom poetry or, or uh, Christ as the bridegroom. Uh, poetry. There's a long history of that imagery in uh, Christianity, employing the bride and bridegroom uh, so that uh, individuals might be able to grasp the, the depth and profundity of this union that we have with Jesus Christ. In fact, one of the um, um, authors who uh, played around with this kind of imagery a great deal was Heinrich Müller, uh, kind of a contemporary of Bach, and in one of his books, he, um, believe it or not, speaks about how God copulates with the believer um, in the Holy Eucharist. Uh, so this was kind of a common imagery at the time of Bach, and people uh, were exposed to it uh, quite frequently. It may strike us as being a little bit uh, risque, uh, maybe uh, a little bit... Um, uh, 
less effective than what it might have been during box time. Maybe even a little bit sweetsy. Uh, in some respects, it just stops short of the uh, uh, worst of pietism. Um, and to, to bring it up to date, it, sometimes the, these uh, poems that use this imagery are, are very close to what some people call Jesus is my boyfriend music. And uh, so uh, be prepared. The spiritual union, however, that the text talks about, both him and Cantata, is a strong pillar in Luther's theology especially in his early years. He wrote at length and spoke at length about what he called the great exchange. Uh, that is, when, when God meets man, when God encounters the human uh, person, uh, the human gets to exchange everything that he or she is and to take on everything that Christ is. And it's a complete and full exchange. So that Christ is dwelling within us fully, completely. Everything about him is available to us. And that once he comes and dwells in us, he does not leave. He does not go on vacation. Uh, he stays permanently. Uh, that's a strong emphasis in Luther's theology in his early years. The hymn in the cantata text muddy that some, that notion that Christ is there permanently. And I think one of the reasons that uh, those two texts, the hymn and the cantata, uh, are not clear about this is that they also take quite seriously the notion of sinner and saint. That is to say that um, Christ may be there fully present to us, uh, giving himself to us, uh, but we as sinful human beings cannot respond in kind and that we uh, are unfaithful to, to that relationship. And so the hymn and the cantata want to acknowledge that as well. The librettist is uh, not on her or his own campaign in this cantata, however, uh, since the uh, libretto of the cantata stays rather faithful to what the hymn text does say. So here is the sermon in a nutshell. First of all, get ready. Christ is coming to dwell in you. That's movement one. He knocks on the door of your heart, a sound that unleashes pure joy, even though your response is not uh, up to what the guest uh, is giving to you. That's movement two. Of course, we all uh, acknowledge the fact that the knocking is embedded in the bread and wine of Holy Communion. Gifts that are immeasurable in worth. That's movement three. Truth be told, um, our joy and our gratitude is mixed with fear and doubt. But even that is embraced by the guest. Uh, that's movement four. Now let's make up a word here, the poet says. This guest, Jesus, is for us a life son, S-U-N. In German it's Lebenszone. And he is our light as well. Even though my faith ranks as mediocre and not very grateful. That's movement five. And now as a kind of a prayer, the, um, the one who is journeying on this uh, trip says, So help me, help me out here, as long as you are uh, gifting me with life and light. Also give me the ability to love you faithfully. That's movement six. And then, while asking for all these things, help me to get over the Lutheran habit of thinking that my ticket to the great banquet is right belief. Rather, help me to trust your love only. And that's movement seven. Just a word about this uh, new word that's made up by the poet Johann Frank, 
Lebenssonne, Life Sun. Um, it's there in movement five, and in one sense, it embodies the climax of the entire cantata. And certainly that movement is the climax of the entire cantata. Uh, for it, it sort of expresses the joy uh, that comes from this union initiated by Jesus Christ and the uh, uh, goal of the journey that's begun in the first movement. The word actually comes from the Song of Songs, the book of Song of Songs, uh, precisely these words here. Who is this that looks forth like the dawn, fair as the moon, bright as the sun? And also from Psalm 19, in the heavens he has set a tent for the sun. When he comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs his course with joy. So it's those two biblical sources that apparently inspired Johann Frank to come up with this new word. Let's talk about the subway shop orchestra. Um, when, you, when you look seriously at, at the scoring of this cantata, it's a little puzzling. And it's like Bach ended up in a, a kind of a subway sandwich shop that sells instruments. And he's going through the line. He says, well, I'll take uh, two recorders and uh, throw an oboe on top of that. And, uh, oh, you might as well give me a little bit of oboe ducaccia as well. Uh, and what's that back in that bin there? Oh, it's a violoncello piccolo. And I'll take one of those too. Put it all on a, on a section of strings uh, with light mail. And off he goes. Uh, it's worth noting that some scholars believe that um, Bach um, frequently associated the sound of flutes, particularly recorders, uh, with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, and with things spiritual, just like he associated things fleshy uh, with double reeds, oboes and oboes d'amour, and uh, oboes da caccia. Um, let's see if that doesn't work out in this cantata. I believe it does. In movement one, what's happening here in movement one is uh, the text is, is urging the soul to get ready for Christ's coming, uh, for the encounter that's about to happen. And so the strings get going in unison, and they're playing a, um, a tune that Someone has described somewhere as turning in on itself. It, it, um, it just, it's, it's kind of looping uh, in by itself, and it has a hard time getting going. It, it just doesn't want to get off the ground. And uh, so I think that kind of represents the, the notion of this spiritual journey that uh, we sometimes don't want to go on it, and uh, it's a hard time to, to get ourselves going. Beneath that, the bass instruments, have a kind of a regular pulse with rests in between uh, that certainly uh, uh, suggests uh, the notion of, of a steady measured walking. Uh, so that's a kind of a journey thing as well. Now over all of that hovers these four wind instruments, uh, the uh, two recorders and the oboe and oboe de caccia. And they're playing very long notes. They're not moving along at all with the, with the steps that are going on uh, beneath them. Uh, they're just sort of there, and they, they change occasionally uh, just to create different harmonies. And one wonders whether um, that is not to evoke from us a kind of a sense that uh, uh, Christ is both uh, 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 God and man, uh, spirit and flesh, uh, Christ is, is hovering and patiently waiting uh, to encounter uh, us as human beings and to come and dwell with us. And this moves on for several measures until the choir enters and with its text uh, and the soprano singing the tune very clearly, the others weaving counterpoint underneath, uh, the text clearly says, that what's happening here is that we are to get ourselves ready, uh, to dress up, uh, which is what the German word means, to comb our hair, take a shower, 
put on good clothes, get ready for this guest that's coming. It would be worth to hear an excerpt uh, of that so uh, you hear a little bit of it. talking about um, these wind instruments uh, and what they might symbolize here, uh, let's look at movement two. Um, the text of movement two is to say, he's here, he's here. So you want to answer the door. And uh, this announcement of he's here, one would think might come from uh, a trumpet or a field trumpet playing a kind of a bugle tune or something. But not so. Bach scores this for flute. It's a transverse flute, uh, admittedly, played easily by the recorder players, so they just changed instruments. But it's a kind of flute that plays it over here. And in Bach's time, it was a little bit stronger than the recorder sound, so chances are that's why he chose to use it here. But it, it's, it's a kind of an unflute-like tune. It's got wide intervals and sounds more like the field trumpet. So um, this is worth uh, looking into. And then you will hear, we're not going to play an excerpt here, but when you finally hear the cantata, um, if you listen carefully in the very first measures of this movement, the bass instrument is um, playing a kind of a figure where there's repeated notes, uh, which sounds an awful lot like somebody knocking at the door. So listen carefully for that too. Then a uh, final example about uh, these wind instruments would be movement five. In movement five, this is the one about the, the, uh, the Lebenszone, um, and it said it was kind of the climax of the cantata. And what the text is describing here is that the union is complete. Uh, we have been able to experience Christ in bread and wine. He is indwelling now. This is pure joy. Everybody is together. So there's a union that happens, that kind of union that Luther described as the great exchange. And that's described musically in this movement with everyone getting together and playing together. So it's scored for the entire orchestra. Uh, and the, the uh, soloist has a bit of a challenge here to sing against uh, that wall of sound. But nevertheless, uh, the, the sound is of such a nature that... Um, that uh, you, you get to hear this sort of unity, this sense of everyone coming together and doing this together. Let's hear a little bit of an excerpt of that too. By the way, in that movement, uh, if, you've, if it hasn't occurred to you already, it's, um, it's an amazing aria, very, very similar to uh, those great arias that come towards the end of the St. Matthew Passion, for instance. Um, and it uh, tends to become an earworm for you. It's a, it's a very lovely tune, it, and it, it kind of expresses all the joy of the wedding uh, and the union that's about to, to happen and is happening. And now let's talk about that violin cello piccolo. Um, it's, uh, first of all, not a Suzuki-sized cello for, for children, but 
is an actual uh, cello um, of uh, uh, some small size. And um, it's a, a cello of four or five strings. And it was so small that it was played by uh, an instrumentalist who stood and rested the cello on a stool. Uh, that's how, how small it was. It had a range that uh, went from the C below middle C uh, to three octaves above that. So it, it spanned quite a bit of, um, uh, of a gamut of sound. Uh, and uh, because of that, composers didn't know how to write for it. What cleft did they choose? Um, and uh, so players of the instrument had to be very facile in moving from one cleft to another uh, because uh, the composers didn't want to uh, want to write all of these ledger lines, which would be necessary if you just stayed in one clef. Um, so that's the uh, violoncello piccolo. Um, Bach used it four, in 14 different cantatas, eight of which, this is fascinating, eight of which um, are written between 1724 and 25. That is, they are chorale cantatas. So um, the theory is that it could have been that there was a visiting uh, violin cellist, piccolo cellist, who was uh, in town uh, during that time. And Bach wanted to make sure that he would use him or her in, in the orchestra. Or maybe he was just in, a, in an experimental mode, uh, which is highly likely too, because he loved new instruments and liked to experiment with them. Uh, or it could have been both of those things. Um, the instrument exists in museums these days mostly. Uh, and so performances of uh, like Cantata 180 uh, will not use a violin cello because you can't find one. Uh, and usually the part is taken over either by a violist uh, or a cellist. And uh, if the cellist takes it over, it's a bit of a challenge because it it lies in the upper tessitura of the instrument. Some musical markers for you in the cantata. Uh, if this piece is, is like a wedding, uh, then there must be some dancing. And so movement one is a gigue-like movement, it's a gigue-like dance. It's not a strict gigue, but it is like a gigue. Movement two is bourree-like. Not a bourree, but bourree-like. It suggests that kind of dance. And movement five, this one that will give you an earworm, is like a polonaise. Um, so the dances pop up uh, during the cantata at various places and keep this wedding mood uh, moving along throughout the piece. Um, in movement three, uh, we have the first of the recitatives, and I want to talk just a little bit about uh, the three recitatives in the cantata. They're each different from one another, and uh, Bach apparently gave them uh, quite a bit of thought. Uh, this first one in movement uh, three begins as a seco recitative. That means that the voice is uh, all alone by, by itself. Uh, together with just the keyboard, uh, nothing else. And it's a typical kind of uh, narration. It's not really measured very well. But it, after a few measures of this seco recitative, the movement breaks into what we call an arioso. It's kind of like an aria, but not an aria. It's kind of like a baby aria. And it's at that point where Bach introduces the violoncello piccolo, uh, with its own obligato part, uh, which is quite lovely and, and uh, a little bit difficult. And, uh, and the, the voice sings uh, a stanza of the chorale, uh, but in ornamented fashion. Uh, so you'll hear the chorale melody. It's there, but it's, it's being ornamented. So that's, that's uh, the first of the recitatives. The second one is in... Um, in uh, movement number four, and uh, movement number four is an accompanied recitative. So it has three, uh, two recorders uh, together with the solo voice, and the, the recorders are 
playing uh, playing a very long notes to begin with, but they become increasingly agitated. So there's more and more activity from from them. So by the time you get to the end, they're doing a lot of uh, a lot of notes, playing a lot of notes. And the reason for that is that the movement uh, is is sort of the the central point of the cantata, where fear and doubt changes into joy. So the fear and doubt moves musically also into joy. Then the final recitative, which is in movement six, begins as a seco recitative as well. Uh, but here again, uh, several measures in it moves into arioso form. This time, the vocalist is given all kinds of uh, unbridled melodic flourishes uh, to indicate the joy uh, that has uh, come to us with Christ in the bread and wine of the Eucharist. Finally, the um, last movement uh, is uh, just a chorale setting by itself, and uh, you'll recognize that uh, very easily. Uh, when I first started thinking about this uh, cantata, I, I contacted Cantor uh, Costello and I said, how come you chose this uh, communion cantata for Palm Sunday? And um, he answered the way I was expected him to and said, uh, we're very close to Maundy Thursday, which is when the church liturgically observes not only the the giving of the great commandment, but also uh, the institution of the Lord's Supper. And uh, so he said that was one thing that moved him, and I suspected uh, that all along. Um, another reason is that Bach wrote only one cantata for Palm Sunday, and you can't keep doing that over and over again. Uh, but his his reasoning, I think, is so so good. And you could even push it a little farther. And that is to say that uh, Holy Week as an entirety is an opportunity for believers to uh, really enter deeply and profoundly into that mystery that Luther called the Great Exchange, where everything that is Christ's, his death and passion and resurrection, becomes ours. And everything that is ours, our failings, our doubts, and our fears, become his. And so in a sense, this cantata, cantata 80, 180 that you are about to hear, is a cantata which summarizes Holy Week and brings it all to kind of a musical expression, musical spiritual expression, even as it is a musical and um, spiritual expression of Jesus himself. So with that said, uh, it, enjoy the cantata. Uh, may it become an earworm for you. And uh, goodbye until the next time. <laughs>